a reminder of the end of the Robert Frost poem. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. When I read to you that section of from the Pullman book, in, which began with that, um, that bit from the Robert Frost poem, um, one of your reactions was, it's like, you want to say it? Or you want me sure. to say it? I'll, I'll, I'll say it. It's like the question of how do you teach somebody to think about a tropical forest. I, mm, I preferred what I heard you say the first time, which right. is it's like being in a tropical forest. You know, for, forget teaching. You know, forget pretending that we already have the stuff. And um, but it's like it's like walking into a tropical forest. It's like and, walking in the sense and that... discovering not the actual path that you may or may not be on and may lose and, and all this, but starting to say, oh, oh, there's there's that and there's that and there's and I don't how do I make sense of this? And as you know, as we say, actually, in the um, forward to the book, um, our very first not our very first trip into the tropics but our second trip as biologists when we were working there as graduate students with uh, john vanderbeer one of our professors um <clears throat> he walked into the for into the rainforest in costa rica and said you know look at all the questions and my response was i just see a lot of green like <laughs> i don't see any questions here at all and they started showing up they, they did, they did, um, but it took a while because it's so much, because the wood in that case is an actual wood. It's an actual rainforest, and it's so complex, and it changes so fast from, like, one foot to next, the next foot. And um, I'm, I'm talking about, like, measures of distance rather than actual feet. Um, and I, I mean, you can, if you're trying to teach it, you can have a path in mind of what it is that you're trying to teach. Um, but it's all, it, it's all still the, the wood and it's so complex. Right. Well, the reason, the reason I would make the point in the way you like, uh, less okay. is a, just be aware this conversation takes place in the context that we do not know very much about how tropical forests work. Right. They are so complex that it is a very difficult puzzle to sort them out. And so nobody here is pretending that we understand them well enough and that we are teaching the students to understand them well also because that's not the state of play but the question of how you start you walk into a forest and you could start by thinking about it in terms of canopy layers and what creatures live in each of these canopy layers you could start thinking about it trophically the energy is captured by the plants uh, in the form of sunlight turned into sugars and starches and and uh, cellulose by uh, photosynthesis um the heterotrophs eat the plants right but, yeah there are a lot of ways you could do it by the biomass of different uh kinds of organisms you could mm -hmm. do it by phylogenetic systematics none of them are correct all none of them are complete None of them are the correct way. Ah, none they, of them are the correct way. If done properly, they are all correct and yes. hopefully self-correcting. Yes. And as we say, I think a couple times in our book, all true narratives must reconcile. All true scientific stories must reconcile. And that's where we come full circle with the, with with Robert Frost here. Right. Yeah. So the point is. Actually, you have to get comfortable. If you're dealing with something like a tropical forest, you have to get comfortable with the fact that you are picking a literal path through it, whether that path is analytical or physical. That path is not, it is a kind of the map is not the territory. The path is not the sum total of the forest. Yeah. But anyone will do, actually. Yes, any, any path um, will reveal something that is consistent with any other path if the path is true within that wood, right? And um, the little bit of research that I want to share here is actually, uh, I'm, I'm reminded with regard to the wood and the path of being in Madagascar the first time uh, where we went, um, where we went after we graduated from college. And I was, we were in Ankarana in the far north and it's a, it's a strange and magical and strange place. <laughs> and uh, there's very little surface water. 
mostly uh, you have to go deep into these caves and you can walk underground in these these caverns into these like pockets of forest where the karst on the limestone karst has collapsed and you've got these pockets of forest that are connected to the outside world. If you're a bird, you can fly in, but if you're like a lemur, um, you're there for life or you have to go through these caves and they don't presumably. Uh, but anyway, I was sitting there and in one of the few places where surface water exists on Ankarana, uh, with a little stream watching crowned lemurs, which are beautiful. Um, you know, lemurs being these um, relatively basal primates that are only on Madagascar. And I was watching them eat the fruits of tamarind. And I thought, I don't, I don't think tamarind is from here. And I had no way to know that then, but I, you know, once we came back, and this was between college and uh, we were going to be starting grad school that fall in Michigan, and I, and I looked into it and went, yeah, tamarind was, in, it's an Indian fruit that was introduced um, by humans to Madagascar who liked, who, who, were, who were cultivating it. And so my hypothesis- Because it's super delicious. It is delicious. It's weird. It's it's also like on current. It's a weird fruit. It is, um, but... and you know you have to have a taste for it. Um, but it's it's delicious, uh, and it's it's very much kind of a, a mammal fruit where you have like you it's it's got this this thick husk and you have to work on it with your thumbs. So it's 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 probably you know very good for primates in general and then you end up with these big seeds that you have to kind of suck on and chew on for a while to get all the all the good fruit pulp off. Um, but I thought. Huh, I wonder if my hypothesis became uh, that primates in places that coexist, non-human primates that coexist with humans, will prefer the fruits uh, that are under cultivation or were brought by humans, and that therefore the native fruits uh, will be getting slowly less common in places where there's fruit under cultivation. That human cultivation effectively, even if it doesn't directly compete uh, against uh, native fruits, will indirectly compete by basically... Um, by having the same sensory experiences and preferences um, uh, as some of the fruit dispersers in the forest. So fast forward to our first summer in grad school, and I decided that I was going to test that hypothesis in um, in a new world forest, in a, in a rainforest in Costa Rica. And this is exactly the same forest where John Vandermeer spread his arms wide and said, look at all the questions, and all I saw was green. And, and when it came time to spend the several weeks doing the research that we would then be presenting for our, our preliminary exams in the fall, I couldn't find any monkeys. Mm -hmm. No monkeys at all. There were no monkeys, and I still to this day don't know why there were no monkeys. Um, but I was out in that forest every day, all, you know, not all day, but like certainly every day from dawn to, to noon, and then often again in the late afternoon, there's no point in going out um, in the hottest part of the day, usually, uh, unless you're doing a particular kind of question. But um, Never found the monkeys, but spent so much time that I stumbled upon a natural experiment that was happening in front of me, and it was with poison frogs. And I'm not going to go into that whole story now, but I, you know, I, I pivoted because I couldn't exactly test my hypothesis on um, primates preferring fruits that humans have brought in if I couldn't find the damn monkeys, <laughs> could I? Um, but the story that the path that I pivoted to is totally consistent with the hypothesis that is still, so far as I know, not tested, uh, but is still active as a possibility in, in that forest. And that actually kind of brings us to this research that I want to say something about. Mm -hmm. uh, but you had something you wanted to Well, I just wanted to say that we don't know if the reason you couldn't find the monkeys is because they were at the market because they preferred human fruit. <laughs> That's right. They were buying up all the mangoes. Yep. Yeah. I don't think they were buying them. That doesn't oh, sound like no, monkeys no, to no, me. No, no, they were not. They were stuffing them in their, in their cheeks and other orifices. <laughs> All right, that got weird fast. <laughs> They're monkeys. I mean, what do you expect? All right, yeah. fair enough. Um, I mean, they don't have suitcases, do they? Backpacks? <laughs> I don't oh, know. That's where my backpack went. Yes. Yeah. Um, Quite possible. No. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Seed dispersal syndrome predicts ethanol concentration of fruits in a tropical dry forest. And to just translate that um, right off the bat, tropical dry forest here is Guanacaste. It's uh, it's a Costa Rican dry forest. It's not a uh, rainforest uh, like what we were just talking about. It's a, it's a seasonal dry forest, um, but where there is definite um, seasonality of when things are fruiting, as as there is anywhere, but um, it's it's distinct there. We spent a little bit of time in Guanacaste ourselves, 
And what they mean here by seed dispersal syndrome is they are characterizing um, mammals and birds as the two major groups of cl classes, clades of organisms uh, that tend to be dispersing fruits, um, which to say plants have an interest in having their seeds dispersed and fruit is a lure and a gift to those animals who would disperse that fruit. And of course, um, some animals cheat and they eat the fruit and they leave the seed where it is or they don't do what is uh, what is expected. But in general, whereas pollinators are often smaller bodied organisms, often insects, um, some bats are um, pollinators, some bats are dispersers. But um, here we're talking about um, mostly larger bodied um, um, mammals and birds. And, um, and they, I'll just, I'll read this little bit from the introduction here. Two prominent groups of vertebrate seed dispersers, birds and mammals, differ in their typical activity patterns and the sensory systems they rely on to find and consume fruit. Avian frugivores tend to be highly visually oriented with tetrachromatic color vision based on four cone types and excellent visual acuity. They also commonly swallow fruits whole. Fruits with bird dispersal syndromes are correspondingly characterized by... Did I say birds? Fruits with bird dispersal syndromes are correspondingly characterized by small size, absence of a protective husk, and high visual contrast. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, frugivorous mammals, including primates, bats, rodents, and ungulates, are typically dichromatic, two-cone vision, red-green colorblind, although monochromacy, single-cone vision, total colorblindness, is found in some nocturnal species, and trichromacy, three-cone vision, human normal color vision, characterizes some primates. Additionally, mammalian frugivores often have sensitive hands and mouths, complex dentition, and large olfactory bulbs and olfactory receptor gene repertoires. Reflecting these anatomical features, mammalian frugivores rely less on vision and more on olfaction and manual buccal haptic sensation and processing during fruit foraging. Indeed, fruits with mammal dispersal syndromes are typically duller and less visually conspicuous, but more odoriferous. They say odoriferous. I always say odoriferous. Yeah. I'm going to go with odoriferous, mm -hmm. even that's not what they wrote. And can be covered by thick husk that requires manual or buccal processing to remove. Okay, so that's a cool setup. And mm -hmm. that's so they're basically going to go in. Um, and say, um, in advance of looking at, uh, in advance of measuring any fruit uh, for ethanol concentration, we are going to describe um, the fruits in terms of what they just said and say, is this, like, is this going to have like mammal dispersal syndrome or avian dispersal syndrome, or is it some combination? And they will say there's, a, you know, there's a bit of, it's, it's not perfect because as they allude to here, primates have actually moved away from the typical mammal mode. Um, and we are no longer, um, lemurs less so, but in the new world here, we're, there are no lemurs. It's all simians. It's all um, monkeys and us. And, um, and we've become, once again, more visual. All our, our olfactory uh, lobe has become our forebrain and, and is the site of processing of memory and, and future planning. And we have frontation where our eyes have moved to the front, so we have binocular vision. And um, the sizes of our noses have shrunk, so we're more bird-like in this way. So you might expect primate fruits to be, to have a, have a, to have a, like an intermediate um, kind of dispersal syndrome to bird and mammal fruits because um, they might be higher contrast and less odoriferous or odiferous, if you want. Uh -huh. um, so if I may have my screen back here for a moment, Zachary, thank you. I'm surprised you can hear me. He's like way over there. Um, <laughs> I know. He's listening to my mic, he says. Um, so they then, they characterize these... Um, fruits as such. And then they went out into the field and they, uh, they measured the ethanol content in a bunch of them. And they indeed found, um, basically what you would, ex what you would expect. So there's a, there's some good, um, yeah, I'm not, that's, that's too complicated. I'm not going to show the phylogeny, but I will show this, um, which is a range of percentage of ethanol concentration. That's percent alcohol by volume of ripe fruits of species sampled in Guanacaste. Um, by seed dispersal syndrome, the birds are on the left. The, the, the bird distributed fruits, as far as they've assessed, are on the left. The mammal distributed fruits, as far as they've assessed, are on the right. And uh, what we see with these, uh, these uh, box plots at the bottom um, is 
uh, how much ethanol uh, each of them have. And with the exception of a couple of the what they think are bird distributed fruits, uh, there's not much ethanol at all, whereas a bunch of the mammal distributed fruits have a lot of alcohol in them, including, including, that's not a word, including your favorite and mine, Spondius mombin. Oh, Spondius is yeah. good. And you know what? And so... You can smell the alcohol when after yeah. after it's dropped and you're just walking across a field of, of spondius, man. And that's really the only way you're going to get spondius because it's, it's a canopy tree yeah, and yeah. It's, the fruits are 75 feet up. But it is yeah. a very tasty, tasty fruit. Yeah. But yeah, it does uh, quickly lean over towards, um, you know. So a, it's getting a, a little buzzed. A, yeah, an yeah. after five kind of a fruit. <laughs> after five kind of a fruit, yeah. So um, this is consistent with their hypothesis. And, um, and there's a, there's a lot that we could say here, but I, re I really, you know, really just wanted to, uh, point out, here's a path that is kind of related to that path that I thought I saw, um, those many years ago, watching crowned lemurs eat tamarind in Northern Madagascar, um, but a slightly different path that is consistent with our understanding of mammals, frankly, as lushes, and birds not so much, uh, and of uh, mammals appearing to prefer, um, and it's, you know, there's, there's no way to know, you know, what, what was the first thing, but you've basically got a positive feedback through selection uh, scenario here, where um, if mammals um, going after fruit that tasted good to them, had a slight preference for um, alcohol in their fruit, then those fruits that had a little bit of alcohol in them got um, got their seeds dispersed more, and on and on and on and on. So did they have a pre-existing hypothesis about which fruits were going to have more ethanol and a rationale? Uh, it was just just that they thought that the mammal the mammal distributed fruits would have more ethanol because they're they're treating the ethanol as a reward distinct yes, from sugar. Yes, they, exactly, and and there's a number of reasons for that, and this gets into there's there's a lot of chemistry here, and it's still very unclear. Uh, I think I think we just we science doesn't really know fully what's going on here, but. Um, you get twice as many calories from the sugar and alcohol as you do the sugar and sugar. Uh, and uh, while there is clearly a toxicity associated with high alcohol, there may be a benefit at low alcohol levels. So mm -hmm. uh, you might indeed find that this is not a binary like alcohol good or alcohol bad, but a little bit of like no alcohol, not as preferable for the for the mammals who are distributing fruits a little bit of alcohol good a lot of alcohol not so good and i think i, I may have gone i wondered also about the protecting the reward if you're going to put a seed if you're going to wrap a reward around a seed and that reward mm -hmm. goes bad so that the disperser won't eat it because they might become sick or because yes it, it doesn't taste good is how they would perceive it right that alcohol might prevent the growth of certain things that would tend to take yes. over a fruit and therefore yes. become something that uh, if a mammal can process it, they would be willing, you know, and th like I say, I've eaten plenty of spondius fruits that were right. a little past their prime and they do have that alcoholy kind of sense about them. Yes. And it's not terribly off-putting. It's not as good as a perfectly exactly ripe spondius. Yeah. But it's not bad. Yeah. No, and I actually, I found myself um, foraging for blackberries yesterday. I went on a walk uh, since I wasn't allowed to go into human company. So um, I went on a, on a beautiful walk and um, certainly tried a couple of blackberries that weren't there yet and had a couple that were perfect and a couple that felt a little bit past their prime mm. uh, and just a little, little, little fermented. Um, here's just a couple um, more intriguing Which is nuggets. interesting that's bird fruit. Um, blackberries. Yeah. I mean, for one thing, the growth habit of the plant makes it very difficult for anything that can't fly to get them. Deer eat them. Yeah, around the edges. Yeah, no, deer, deer eat them all the time. That's true. Yeah, I mean, and then the blackberries that are here are introduced, they're Himalayan mostly. So, you know, it's all, there's all sorts of layers of like, what, what was the intention here? But, um, I'm not, I, I, I would put blackberry at, uh, at, 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 an intermediate uh you know it doesn't have the husk it's not yeah. giant it does have tiny seeds um so um 
so it does it does fit the avian model to some degree but um they also do have a, a delightful smell mm -hmm. um, that's especially true when, when the sun is hitting that's them. true I, I accept that this is a generalist yeah. and actually people don't talk enough about generalist syndromes yeah usually syndromes isolate you to a clade of dispersers or, or right. uh, distributors well and i think i mean with the blackberry with any of those that that clade of berries uh where it's um god is it a Root. No, I can't remember what the what the category is, but um, lots of tiny little seeds that are inherently unextractable from yep. the fruit. Um, that you, you swallow. That you swallow. You are going to be taking this. Like they don't like these fruits are not interested in toilets. They, they, that's a, that's a loss for them. Yep. Um, but for everything else that's eating them, uh, as as long as they don't have a digestive tract that's you know a centimeter long and it doesn't come out right away, they're going to be dispersing the fruit somewhat. So yep. unless there's something that the blackberry is benefiting from in the gut of birds or the gut of mammals that is, um, you know, scratching it up and making it more likely to, um, to, to germinate, um, I think they're, they're pretty generalist. Mm -hmm. Here's a couple of other little, little um, fun things from this paper, uh, which just went tiny on me. No, no, this is from the discussion. Notably, the metabolic pathway used to use to ferment sugars and produce ethanol emerged in the early Cretaceous, at approximately the same time that angiosperms shifted from producing small wind-dispersed fruits to large fleshy, fleshy vertebrate-dispersed fruits with fermentable sugars. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. The timing is, con is convergent. And then uh, some frugivorous mammals, including African elephants, squirrel monkeys, pigtail macaques, and eye eyes are sensitive to ethanol odors. That is, they can smell them. Interesting that eye eyes is on that list, and it shows up on this final list. Some mammals, including humans, African great apes, and eye eyes, exhibit a mutation in their ADH7 gene that yields a 40-fold improvement in enzymatic efficiency for ethanol metabolism. And these animals may have significant exposure to dietary ethanol. Mm. Humans, African great apes, and eye eyes. What are eye eyes doing on that list? Eye eyes are this crazy clade of lemurs that, again, are only on Madagascar. And insectivorous. And, and well... Uh, insectivorous, but they also they're eating gums. They're like they're they're using that long finger of theirs to dig out stuff and um, and um, so what what is happening there? But it does seem that we have a particular ability to uh, deal with alcohol and therefore uh, and and add to that. Um, although they don't say it here, uh, I suspect that we humans are also sensitive to uh, ethanol odors. Mm -hmm. That we can uh, we can process it better, um, enzymatic enzymatic efficiency for ethanol metabolism, and we can sense it better. And once you have those two things, uh, you're probably going to seek it out some if it has some value. Again, at low doses, but not at high. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Okay, that's my um. That's that's, that's my path. That's through, your path through dry tropical forests for today. All right. Yeah. Cool.